Amazing. Right, Joe Walker, uh, tell us, when you first started editing Sicario, uh, what was your strategy? Because you've got a uh, unique approach to it, as I understand. Well, you know, um, Roger Deakins and, um, and Denny had worked together before on Prisoners, and they, you know, the, their approach before I came onto it was to plan very carefully. Um, I guess because the budget, although big for some films, wasn't really quite big enough for the amount of action and the location changes. So they were very scrupulous in their planning. And so my strategy just really was to, um, you know, to enjoy these dailies that I was getting from Roger and just to be very rhythmic and muscular and uh, about it. It felt like um, I could really sort of manage the tension, you know, with the pacing of the film and to be super um, accurate, really, you know, sometimes using some very different strategies to what I've normally done. For example, often cutting mute, completely mute, which I tried on this film. I mean, that was a conversation with Denny that, in fact, the first time we met, I talked to him about working with music and that I was getting sick of temp tracks because I found that forces composers into, you know, create some original music. And also, it's this sort of big energy sapping thing. I could spend ages, I mean, like, my background was in music and sound, so I can waste so much time doing temporary things. And, you know, fundamentally, you know in a cut whether the tension in a film is, and the storytelling is successful because it's successful, or whether it's been propped up by various things like the propulsive rhythm of music. So it's kind of very good to be able to kind of, if you can create an almost silent movie that works, then you know that you can build from that and then you can let out the air a little bit and allow music to um, uh, have, a, have a feature in it. So I don't know, there were, you talk about strategy, there was no big clear one, but I wanted to try a new trick on this film, which was to try and cut um, mute or at least without music. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a generally held belief in Hollywood filmmaking that if you can watch a film with the sound off and still know what's going on, then you've made a successful film. Uh, so when you first looked at the cut, were you successful? Um, the first, yeah, the first assembly screening was pretty good. I mean, there was still, you know, there was work to do. But, you know, we're talking about how much work was there to do. Well, there was some tough decisions to make about some scenes that we felt had to go. And um, there was a little bit of street, there was some story streamlining. Um, you know, fundamentally, the film is told from Kate's point of view, for the most part. Things are seen through her eyes. But you also had this tangential story of the Mexican cop, and you don't know where that's going. You know, we all know that it may, may not end well. <laughs> you don't know, kind of quite know how he connects to the story. So there was a kind of critical mass of, of counterpoint there. And there was a third little storyline that we, we, we eliminated. And that, you know, that was typical of the kind of changes we made after the first assembly. But, um, you know, Denny used to love it when I just turned the sound down and we'd cut, you know, I can remember he sort of gets excited. You just and look, even dialogue scenes sometimes, amazingly, you know, you know that the, the words after a while when you've been working on a scene for so long. And so you're sort of saying them in your own head while looking at the cut and then just inspecting and, you know, you're very conscious of the eyes and people eyeballing each other and the, the, the perfect rhythm of visually. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and Roger, I mean, look, come on, Roger Deakins is... <laughs> <laughs> He's just in a class of his own in terms of, you know, he's a great, he and Denny together as well, it's just great sequence builders. You know, they, they'll they do all, you know, when you're on the bridge, for example, you know, you have all the, the pieces in place and then they give you a shot like the one of the dog in the back of the car, just to ratchet up the tension in a very animal way. And um, mm. so I don't know, they, you know, you're working, you're working with people at the top of the game. So uh, it's uh, never difficult to cut. There's these great sequences in the movie, you know, where you're building tension in certain sequences. 
um, and through music and through the photography. Um, you know, you're showing these like majestic landscapes and there's just a propulsiveness underneath. Can you talk a bit about cutting those together? Well, I mean, um, uh, the landscape is really important. I mean, sometimes, I mean, the great, um, the nice thing in the pacing is sometimes to have a very tense scene like the bridge sequence and then afterwards you can let the air out a little bit. And there are two scenes, for example, when they've come back from Juarez and they've kidnapped somebody and he's been dragged off to be uh, interrogated. And you have a moment, um, first of all, you have a wide shot with, um, in the army base with Josh Brolin's character, Matt, um, uh, telling Kate, Emily Blunt's character, that she's just got to soak it all up and she's letting off steam saying, you know, you nearly started a war. And, you know, we just hold back and let that play in a, a big wide shot with the kind of flag flapping, the American flag, and it felt poignant to do it that way. And then there's a little moment later when you go upstairs and uh, somebody says, do you like fireworks? A soldier says, do you like fireworks? And they walk across the rooftops and then look through binoculars and they see all the bombs going off in distant Juarez. And I suppose, you know, you could be tempted just to cut to what they see and uh, not have this fantastic tracking shot. Mm -hmm. It felt like, you know, I deserved the right to kind of let out the, you know, uh, you know, bring a bit of air into the film. I mean, years ago, it's funnily, I was thinking of this the other day, I used to joke with, um, when I was a TV editor at the BBC, I used to joke sometimes that one approach might be to apply the rules of this uh, very famous uh, BBC Radio 4 channel um, uh, a Radio 4 panel show called Just a Minute and what they do is they ask people to talk for just a minute on a subject and you lose points if you repeat yourself or hesitate or deviate. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a very enduring show, it's been going for like 73 seasons, it's, it's incredible longevity. But of course what happens, so I used to joke with people that I would cut their uh, dialogue like that and take all the air and repetition and deviation out of it and try and make the story straight line, you know, very super efficient. And, and of course, you know, in, with some maturity, you realize that's just a terrible plan, you know, because yeah. actually, you know, repetition defines character and development and, you know, pattern is something we're all, you know, highly programmed to recognize. And certainly in Steve McQueen films, you know, you sort of I make, you know, I'm always zeroing in on those little rituals and repeated things that mark the, you know, signposts of the story. And uh, repetition, yes, and then deviation, you know, some of the best things in films are, in my view, <laughs> you know, nothing to do with the plot. You know. mm -hmm. I, uh, I was thinking about the estate agent showing somebody around a house and it's on fire and synecdoche, you know, that kind of swipe <laughs> off. No, it's not part of the narrative, it's just a glorious vignette, you know. And then, um, and, you know, uh, with hesitation, hesitation's like the, the keyest one because sometimes you need time as an audience to kind of anticipate, you know, it's just a, and you need time to kind of absorb what you've just received. You can't just keep relentlessly shocking people things have to shape up. And with Sicario, there's a great advantage that very early in the film, you start with a kind of shock and surprise and jolts. You know, she opens the door and there's a huge explosion and you're not expecting it. And the film just delivers shocks and surprises. And it means that when you hold on a shot for a long time, sometimes later in the film, for example, when they go down the hill into darkness, it's very, very tense because you've established that this film could just come at you at any, something could come at you at any time. Um, so I don't know, I enjoyed that sort of um, interesting, interestingly uneven pacing. You know. And it is unique for uh, movies of this kind, you know, uh, that you do take these moments to just slow things down, let things be a little quieter. Uh, was there ever a moment where you thought this uh, we're slowing things down too much or you know to the detriment of the pace of the film uh no i think we got it right i mean i um i've watched it with cinemas and it, it, with audiences and that's part of the process that i really love is the fact that you 
you have a vague idea when you're, you know, hopefully not too, too vague an idea when you're cutting it, but it's only when you really measure it against an audience of, you know, 500 people in New Jersey that you can tell whether they're on the edge of their seat or not, or, you know, it's like they used to say, you know, I don't want, I don't just want bums on seats, I want eyes on stalks. <laughs> you know? um, so you're carefully measuring that, and that's something that you take into account. I mean, especially if you're working on a comedy, not that I've done a lot of that recently, but, you know, sometimes a laugh that you didn't anticipate can drown the next line, and you just have to give it 18 more frames, and then everybody gets the laugh, and they get the next line. And, you know, these things are, they take some finessing. And um, in the case of this film, Scario, I felt it was, you know, we, we got a kind of rhythm really sharp. I mean, we came out of a screening in Toronto, and I hadn't seen the film for some months. And I talked to Denny afterwards, and I said, you know, I hate to be self-congratulatory, but I really wouldn't change anything. You know, that was, I think that's a rare case where we, it's exactly what we wanted. You know, it's exactly what we wanted. And, uh, uh, you know, that makes it a very, very happy edit. Mm -hmm. You're currently working on Denny's uh, next movie. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what's that collaboration like? You know, it must have been good if you wanted to go back for another one. Um, well, you know, working with somebody a second time is always glorious because there's a shorthand. And, um, you know, I never take for granted how lucky I am to be in this room at all. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm, you know, hopefully I hopefully haven't got complacent. But, you know, I've got to know his sense of humor. Actually, this time we've really enjoyed the absurd competition between us about <laughs> screeners. We have these um, industry screeners popping up at this time of year, you know. Oh, I know about this, yeah. Woman and girl. And I always, like, I always win, hands down. Mine always turn up earlier than his. <laughs> and I always get, like, three kind of <laughs> copies. Um, whereas he gets one. And so, I, I don't know, it was like, I'm afraid there's just this absurd, laddish uh, kind of competition between the two of us right now. <laughs> so, what, in your opinion, uh, as an editor, what is it that makes good editing? Is there a philosophy behind that? I mean, I really love being in the middle of things, and I think you have to have an aptitude on many fronts. I mean, I used to, you know, I came up from sound and music. That was my background. I was, you know, trained as a classical orchestral composer, and I did that until quite recently, until about eight years ago, as a, as a job, you know, writing for documentaries and art, art documentaries and some drama, and children's shows and cartoons and this, this and that. So I had that sort of skill base, but I found it, um, as a job, I found it very isolated. If I felt like I was in orbit around the world, you know, and sort of occasionally, you know, your contact with a director working on a film, you might speak to them so sporadically, and you're waiting for some feedback and you can't go on without getting that feedback. And I used to feel sort of peripheral and, um, uh, and it was very scary sometimes heading towards a deadline uh, and not feeling that you were sort of, you know, completely connected with things. Whereas, you know, in editing room, you're in the middle of picture, sound, sound effects, story. And the biggest plus for me, which I've always loved, is working with performers, you know, and working with, you know, choices between one performance and another. And um, um, so I don't know, it's a, to me it's kind of you're in the still point of the turning world and that's where I'd always love to be. I mean it just has a, I get to have a handle on many different things and I think, uh, you know, I tried to develop strengths where I didn't have them before perhaps and, um, you know, I've never been that great at colour correcting for example. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just trying to learn stuff, you know, all the time. But I mean, I think I bring a load of sound attitude. I mean, sometimes I think I'm just a composer that went in the wrong door. So I can't really pontificate about what makes a good editor, except for the fact to say I've been lucky enough to work on some good films that make me look quite good as an editor. <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, you have to have an aptitude with performance. You have to have a feeling for story. And you have to know, you have to have an instinct for, you know, I think you're following your instinct very, very much all the time as an audience member that's yourself, you've seen thousands of films over the years, so you 
end up sort of having a kind of internal imperative that you get to trust and follow to say, who do I want to be looking at right now in this sequence? You know, what would be a really interesting way to, to uh, you know, what's the most interesting moment to cut to somebody? I've got, if I could deviate a little bit, there was a oh, really, yeah. there was a, a really brilliant um, opportunity I had a couple of years ago. I was invited to talk to some students in York University up in the north of England. And I took with them, I asked Steve McQueen, I said, do you mind if I take the sequence from Shade? And it was just the simplest sequence I could think of taking because we were going to do a practical workshop. So I gave them all the dailies from the scene, which was a scene where Kerry Mulligan is a nightclub singer and sings to uh, an audience, including her brother, played by Michael Fassbender. And the way that Steve shot it was so simple. It was basically the song. She's singing New York, New York as a slow ballad. Very interesting choice. And there's a, there's a close-up of her. And there's a close-up of him. And that was it. You know. <laughs> and I remember when the dailies came in, I was like, oh, Jesus, Steve, you know, you've given me two shots. I've got nothing else to go to, you know. It's a three and a half minute long song right in the middle of the film. Mm -hmm. There's no narrative at all going on in this point. You know, basically somebody's gone to see their sister sing a song. So I was like, ugh. And uh, it was like, how do you, and now she ends up being fascinating to look at because of what the actors brought to it and the extraordinary performance of the song. And there is, uh, the, the, the question was, how do you edit it? And I let all the students have a go. And the way I'd cut it was um, just to pick the right moment to go one time and only one time to Michael. And that's at the point where she's saying, it's up to you, New York, New York. And it has, and she seemed to be looking very definitely in his direction, and it felt like it was a perfect way to say, to convey the subtext that I've messed up in all these towns, and I'm a, I know that I'm a, I've had, you know, terrible disasters in my emotional life, but I'm going to lean on you for a little while and need your help in this town. And then the reaction he gave was an extraordinary one, where he sort of dropped a tear, and it was like it's, has this uncomfortable feeling that um, he is not brought to a happy place by the arrival of his sister and is not ready to help her. So it's kind of a lot of subtext in this scene. And um, anyway, the students, some of the students um, cracked it, you know, and did that thing of being very, lim you know, very uh, subtle and, and um, unintrusive as editors, and that was really enjoyable. In fact, one person did a version which was had no cut to Michael at all. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it was just the song. And I, I really applauded that. I thought that was a fair, I wish I'd even thought of that, but it, it fell. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some people, you know, made the classic mistake of just cutting all the time, and they sort of pool of sweat at the end of the session, trying to kind of match a reaction shot to the lyrics, and try and kind of like use Michael's face to illustrate the song, and then it, you know, get into all sorts of trouble because of continuity of his emotional life. And you know, it was like, and actually, ironically, those which were more cut, more, you know, more event rates were the more boring ones. Whereas the most fascinating ones were the one with the least amount of cuts. Because you really investigate the screen, you look into the screen, and the longer you hold things sometimes, the more it's like reality, you know, you're sort of, it's a little cheat, you know, with 12 Years a Slave, there's an element that you just hang back and you just show a guy hanging on a tree and he's dancing on the mud and after a while you sort of want to get up, you know, you want to get up and try and stop it, it's just so, so horrific and, you know, it's, it's teasing out that really awkward time. Mm -hmm. um, with no kind of comfort zone of an editor sort of holding a hand and showing you some other pretty pictures. You know, it's like, a, it's, let's put a frame around this and try and make it more like reality, and there's a tension to that. So I don't know, that was my discovery over the years. I don't, it's just knowing when not to cut. I'm just a big fan of not cutting <laughs> as an editor. Mm -hmm. Do you think your background in music helped you learn rhythm, which is so integral to editing? I mean, you you talked about attributes of an editor, but surely one of them is kind of clicking your fingers at the same time as your director, and that's going to be a sort of attribute. And um, I feel sometimes I 
I don't know, I go into a funny place looking at performance and editing where I'm inside the action in some way. I mean, the real example of that is that if you're cutting a fight sequence, sometimes at the end of the day, your muscles ache. It's really weird. It's <laughs> like you've been rolling with the punches. You know, you're doing the moves inside. You're not moving at all, but mentally you are. And um, you're sort of trying to find the inner rhythm of things all the time. I mean, that's, that's really the thing I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations on the film. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Zach. Thank you. It was nice talking to you, too. Thank you. Very informative. Bye.